The opinion was written by J. Bybee, and that's quite significant. J. Bybee is one of the most conservative judges on the Ninth Circuit. He's probably most famous for being the co-author of the torture memos with John Yoo. And if J. Bybee is willing to recognize this as cruel and unusual punishment, it does open the door to some others for serving life sentence under the three strikes law for being able to get relief. We still don't know whether the United States Supreme Court is going to review Gonzalez versus Duncan. Hopefully they won't, but it's not yet known. Another promising development from the court came just a couple of weeks ago. There's a three-judge panel. There's a three judges chosen at random. The Ninth Circuit Judge Stephen Reinhardt and District Judges Lawrence Carlton and Thelton Henderson. And they're hearing a case about the lack of adequate medical care in California prisons. Depending on the statistics you choose, there's about 170,000 prisoners in California for a system that was made for 100,000. By every account, the medical care in California prisons is cruel and inhumane. These judges have said that either California has to provide adequate medical care or it's going to have to release over 50,000 prisoners. Now, I would imagine if California were to implement this ruling, it will begin by releasing those who are serving life sentences for the most minor crimes, those who are the least threat to society. And so if this ruling stands, then I think there is the opportunity for relief for some of your loved ones, some who are serving cruel and inhumane sentences. I'm not optimistic, though, that this ruling is going to stand and the 50-some thousand prisoners are going to be released. The Attorney General of California, Jerry Brown, has said he would take this ruling to the United States Supreme Court. It was only a tentative ruling at that, not a final opinion. So it's a long time before this ruling is going to lead to anyone being released. Beyond that, the courts don't offer too much hope. The reality is that the Obama presidency isn't going to make the Supreme Court any more liberal. Why do I say that? Think about where the vacancies are likely to come on the Supreme Court between January 20th, 2009 and January 20th, 2013. John Paul Stevens will turn 89 years old on April 21st of this year. He's in good health, but it doesn't seem likely that he's going to still be on the court at age 93 in 2013. Ruth Bader Ginsburg just a couple of weeks ago was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. By all accounts, it was caught at an early stage, but the reality is that it is one of those deadly forms of cancer, and there's a lot of speculation that she might step down from the court this summer. There is a widely circulated rumor that David Souter is going to retire and go home to New Hampshire, maybe as early as this summer. Now think of the other side of the ideological aisle. John Roberts turned 55 years old last month in January. If he remains on the court until he's 88, he'll be Chief Justice until the year 2043. Samuel Alito is 58 years old. Clarence Thomas is 60 years old. Anthony Kennedy and also Antonin Scalia are each 72 years old. The best predictor of a long lifespan is being confirmed for a seat on the United States Supreme Court. These five justices aren't going anywhere in the next four years, maybe not anywhere in the next 10 years. So President Obama replacing Justice Stevens and her Justice Ginsburg and her Justice Souter isn't going to change the ideology of the court. He's going to replace them with justices of about the same perspective. All three of these justices dissented in Ewing and Andrade. The replacement surely would have as well. Now, I think President Obama can make a difference with regard to the lower federal courts. There are two vacancies on the Ninth Circuit right now. Other judges on the Ninth Circuit are eligible for senior status and become eligible for senior status. 
There's three vacancies on the federal district court here in Los Angeles. And it is so important that we pressure President Obama and Senators Boxer and Feinstein in any ways we can to fill these vacancies right away. We need to remember what happened during the Clinton presidency. When President Clinton took office in January of 1993, there was a vacancy on the Ninth Circuit. He didn't fill it during the first two years of his presidency. Well, then what happens in November of 1994 is the Republicans take both houses of Congress and his ability to put progressives on the Ninth Circuit or on the federal district court was tremendously limited. It is so essential that the President and the Senators act immediately to fill these vacancies and put judges on the court who will be sensitive to claims of cruel and unusual punishment. But ultimately, the solution is going to have to come through the political process. And I believe that the only silver lining of the horrible economy that's affecting everybody is it provides an opportunity for reform of the three strikes law unlike there's ever been before. It provides a chance for political pressure to end incarceration of individuals for truly minor crimes. The statistics about incarceration are really staggering. A couple years ago, this country reached the one million mark in the number of people who were incarcerated. The incarceration rates in this country are five to 10 times greater than any Western nation. The number of children with a parent incarcerated doubled in the last decade alone. Why did this happen? Well, the politics over the last decade or two has all favored longer incarceration for ever more people. Unlike courageous elected officials like Sheila Kuehl and Jackie Goldberg, too many elected officials simply will vote any time to increase punishments and make more things a crime. The number of federal crimes has increased dramatically in recent decades. Why? Because members of Congress or the Senate don't want to be on record as appearing soft on crime. Same thing is true in the California legislature and legislatures around the country. Also, there are strong organized interest groups to push for greater incarceration. Most of the money to defeat the initiative in 2004 came from the California Prison Guard Union. They have been an enormously powerful force against reform of three strikes laws and to keep more people incarcerated. But now this day, now our country simply can't afford the ludicrousy of incarcerating people for long periods of time for minor crimes. It costs about $30,000 a year to incarcerate a person in the state of California. Even if you let shoplifters steal all they want to in the course of a year, it wouldn't nearly come to the amount that it costs to keep them in prison. It makes no economic sense. At a time when funding for schools, elementary schools, high schools, state colleges, state universities, community colleges, is being devastated. How can we afford $30,000 a year for imprisoning people for the most minor of crimes? And so I think there is the chance now to pressure the legislature to put another initiative on the ballot to really reform the three strikes law. I don't think there has ever been a better window for reform than right now. This is such an incredibly important organization because this organization is all about making sure that people don't forget. That we don't forget that there are human beings who have lost precious years of their lives to the most trivial offenses. There are families that are devastated by the continued use of the three strikes law for non-serious and non-violent crimes. So I come before you now seven and a half years after I last spoke to you to say, we need to go forward as never before. We need to mobilize. We need to bring about change. And we really have the opportunity to do so. Thank you.